Um, good morning. So I'm João uh, Damas from Acelera. This with me is uh, Adria from UPF. Uh, and we'll be talking today about uh, high throughput molecular dynamic simulations for drug discovery. So, um, mainly UPF and uh, Acelera collaborate uh, very deeply on this, on this subject and we share software. Sometimes UPF develops software that then uh, Acelera uses or the other way around. So, um, yeah, we are uh, collaborating in this, in this uh, co the CompioMed project together. So, First of all, uh, a little bit of introduction, to maybe uh, for the people that don't know about drug discovery or a little bit to, to remind, refresh a little bit the, the, the minds. So uh, drug discovery, what is it? So it's, it's basically the process uh, by which uh, new medications get, uh, are discovered. So uh, for this, it's also important to know what, what actually is a drug. Sometimes people forget about it. So basically, drugs act on biological targets, which are normally proteins, but it can be nucleic acids or other biomolecules. And uh, they, they change the behavior of function of these targets by binding to them. So this is normally what, what all the drugs that you take nowadays for your cold, for whatever, that normally what, what they do is this. Um, so here we have a, a, an example of the, the drug discovery pipeline, which normally and, uh, takes many years. Uh, this is, and it's also very expensive, all this process. So this is also why uh, from, from the beginning until the, we have so from the beginning, we have a target identification until we have a drug. It normally takes, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years, maybe more. Um, and it's a very expensive process. And most of the candidates for drugs that start the process, uh, they don't reach the final, uh, uh, the final uh, stage. They, they start to get, uh, basically, they, they fall off in, during the, the, the diverse stages as you go through target, target identification, then it generation, so you try to find new, to find hits for, for example, for drugs, and then you try to optimize them, then you go to preclinical trials, and then when you go to the clinical trials, we already have here some candidates for drugs, and this normally is when things start to fail. Uh, when we have, we have the clinical trials and normally some drugs are not working very well even though they, they perform very well in in vitro studies or in animal studies. And even after all this has been successful, we still have the, the approval from FDA or from the European uh, uh, equivalent of FDA, which I don't remember the name right now, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so what we will be focusing here today uh, about drug discovery is this initial part. So uh, drug, uh, drug uh, research and development is mostly done in vitro and in silico. And I focus here on the in silico part because, I mean, we are on a, a course that's basically computational. So uh, uh, the in silico approaches, so they, they can be used in all of these three initial stages of drug discovery that, uh, that we show over here, okay? And this, these are, there are many, many tools and many, many um, uh, approaches available for, uh, computational approaches in silico approaches available for, uh, to, to help guide this process of drug discovery. So also a bit of review of uh, target ligand binding, so the, the um, a physical, a physical view of it. Um, so basically, uh, the basic goal of the first stages of drug discovery is to predict whether a given molecule will bind to a target, and if so, how strongly. So this normally uh, means uh, calculating uh, macroscopic physical properties uh, from, from the microscopic binding process. So, what is happening in the test tube, what is happening in the cells, okay, it can, it can, uh, it can be measured, right, through experiments. And uh, normally these experiments uh, give us, like, for example, how strong a bind drugs, it, normally through a number, okay. 
the number that classifies how strong a drug binds. But this has a meaning of what's happening molecularly, okay, at the microscopic level. So there's a target, um, okay, there's, there's a target that you want, okay, a, a protein, and then there's a ligand, and this ligand is interacting, but you're not actually seeing this, right? You're, normal, you're, you're just trying to infer how, how does this work through some experiments that normally quantify uh, macroscopic properties. And normally there's the equation that there's theory behind the, the binding of molecules. Uh, so this is physical chemistry and you can extract properties. Here is just thermodynamic properties like equilibrium distribution or the, the free energy of binding, which is something that is, uh, well, it's what we're trying to basically do here when we do uh, to know how, how if a given molecule bind and how strongly normally this 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 number will tell us which is called the free energy of binding okay so um, uh, yeah this uh, this slide is just to, to give a little bit the the sense that this this uh, objectives that we are trying to reach at the macroscopic level, either when we do an experiment on a mouse or in vitro or in a person, it's actually there, there, are some, there are some physical experiments that you can do in order to test, for example, many drugs at the same time and just look at a, a given number, okay? Okay, so there's this thing in, um, well, in most uh, pharma companies around the world, which is called the computer-aided drug discovery, they have even have departments, which is called the CAD departments, that are people just working uh, on these type of approaches. So we show here, again, the same, the same uh, drug are in the pipeline. And um, we show here some, some, some of these tools that are available on the different stages, like for example, comparative modeling or pocket detection. So pockets are, are, way, uh, are, are the binding sites of, of these uh, ligands to the, the, the targets. Okay, then, then we have post prediction, like through docking or MD simulations, where you try to see after we, for example, know where the pocket is, uh, how does these different molecules bind uh, in this binding site, in this, in this pocket. Then there's also the ligand generation. We try to, to the, through many, to many different computational tools that exist as well, to explore the chemical space. So there's, there's, there are molecules that are known, but we also we can synthesize new ones. So how can we explore this chemical space, okay? So this can also be done computationally. And then there's also the, the, the lead generation and optimization, which is a lot of, again, some of the previous uh, uh, methods like calculation of pharmacophores, for example, but also other, 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 um, uh, other, uh, other concerns as well as administration, how does it uh, absorb, for example, the drug. There are some also computational tools in order to predict many of the macroscopic properties that we are interested. Okay, when a drug, uh, when you go to the pharmacy and you have a drug, you have a pill or whatever is the means of application of that drug, but that drug, since you take it until it reaches its target, it has its pathway, it passes through the body, it has lots of different interactions and all these things and it can be predicted computationally or can be tested then further ahead on the clinical trial, on the animal studies and clinical trials. So, the methods that we choose depends a lot, the, method, the computational methods that we choose depends a lot on the speed accuracy trade-off. So traditionally um, in, a, in a pharma companies uh, we want fast answers, okay? We, want, and we don't want to wait three months for an answer, especially for, uh, uh, for example, uh, high throughput screening, for example, for some docking. Docking, for example, is a tool that is very fast, gives answer very fast. So you can do a throughput of many, many molecules. So, but there's also some, some limitations on its accuracy, okay? So it's this trade-off of speed and accuracy that, that, um, that guides us as well to choose the methods, okay? So here is where I, I'm going to talk about the methodology that we have been, uh, uh, that we're going to talk about today. 
and uh, that's not been traditionally been used in the in the pharma companies because it's a a more accurate solution but that has a high computational costs so in general pharma companies have have avoided it so the the thing is that with uh, increasing uh, improvements in software and in the hardware this computational cost keeps decreasing so this uh, uh, alternative keeps being more and more attractive as time goes by to, for pharma companies to do, um, to do. Okay, so molecular dynamics, what is it? Um, so basically it's a computational method that allows you to simulate the system at the atomic level, okay? It's, 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 it's basically this is the definition of molecular dynamics. So uh, for that we need an atomic model of the system of interest Okay, for example, a protein in water. This is a target, for example, a protein in water. Okay, um, and what these simulations do is allow us to observe the mechanical movement of the system along time. Okay, so we normally don't think this way, but molecules are always moving. They are dynamic. Okay, and uh, the way that their dynamics uh, is important in order to, for us to recover these properties. Okay. So um, here I have just, we have just a general picture to, to situate uh, molecular dynamic simulations on something that is important as well, which is the size of the systems that we want to study. Because molecular dynamics, I mean, I'm, t I'm talking here molecular dynamics, then I'm, I'm focusing on, on, on this proteins in water and the drug discovery, okay? But molecular dynamics is a more general field, academic field, where people can do molecular simulations of many, many things, um, not only uh, of, uh, on this particular application, okay? So one of, uh, you can see here several experimental um, uh, methodologies like electrophysiology, FRET, AFM, NMR, X-ray, electron microscopy. So we are, these, these, these squares over here situate a little bit the, the time scale and the size of the systems that you can study. The time scale is also here very important. So why is the time scale important? Because you have here several uh, processes, chemical processes and biological processes, like here we have some chemical process like electron transfer, light adsorption, proton transfer, but some of them like electron transfer and proton transfer are also very important biological uh, functions. And then you have more, um, Macros, um, more slow, more slow phenomena like solute permeation or active transport or, for example, folding or protein translation. So this, so inside the cell there are a bunch of biological functions happening, and uh, and the, their, their time scale is also important. Okay, so for example, binding is 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 situated around here. Okay, in this in this time scale. So it's important that this tool, molecular dynamics simulations, can be working on these on this, on this, uh, this timescales. And more and more, this, this, as, as computational power increases, this, 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 goes, this square goes over this side, okay, to higher uh, timescales, where, where also some binding processes or some molecules or drugs also have some, some, some of their binding occurring at these time scales, okay? The size is also important because there are different types of systems, okay? That we can be ch studying um, a kinase, for example, which is a particular enzyme or which is relatively small, or we can be studying a big system like, for example, GPCR, which is one of the proteins that is most targeted by most of the drugs that are available in the market right now. And this is like a membrane protein, okay? Which is a bigger system to set up. So it's, it's also important that we can go on, on this, on this, on this uh, uh, axis as well. So talking a bit about protein, so a little bit of interaction now, because I see some faces over there, but who, who has knowledge about proteins? Do you all guys know about proteins, the amino acids, the molecular structure? Who doesn't know about proteins? Nobody. Okay, everybody knows about proteins. Perfect. Uh, so I can I can move for, uh, fast on this on this on this side. 
Um, uh, so we have here, so dr drug discovery targets are normally proteins, that's why I'm talking about proteins, which normally exhibit complex molecular structure, okay? So uh, in order for us, for molecular dynamics or for this type of approaches to model proteins correctly, we need their native structure. And this is where a protein data bank uh, comes, which, which is basically a database where people that determine uh, structures that can be determined by mainly two techniques, X-ray crystallography and NMR uh, can be deposited. So this, these atomic coordinates of proteins are deposited there. And here we have an array of proteins represented as, as surface, where you can see that there are different sizes of proteins. So here, for example, we have a, a virus. Here we have some membrane proteins. So their size, the thing that I was telling before, so there are different sizes of, of systems. But this is like a, a con an array of, of, of proteins that are available in this database. So for example, if you're, <clears throat> if you're interested in studying a given target, it's important for you to have its structure. It's either available on public databases or you need as an a, a institution, as a pharma company or whatever, trying to research on that target, you should probably get the structure. Uh, this is also something important, which is Sometimes the PDB also contains structures that are already of proteins with ligands. So you can also do studies of ligand binding with these techniques, okay? Um, and for those that are a bit forgetting, which we will be seeing throughout the, this, this, uh, this talk, so this session, so it's important to remember the, the structure, so amino acids, then they can, they can form secondary structure, okay? And then tertiary structure, that, that is the complex structure that, that proteins have. So, for people that may be um, a bit more forgotten of the, of the structure. But we can always revisit this, don't hesitate to ask questions as well. Um, so, let's, let's talk a little bit about another side. So, we have these coordinates, right? So, but what, what exactly is this molecular dynamics? So, how, how is it this working? So, basically, there's a physical model behind it, okay? And uh, the physical model that we use after we have the coordinates is that based, based on the coordinates that we have, we can have what we call uh, um, a force field, okay? What is a force field? Basically, it's a sum uh, of different interactions that exist at the atomic level, okay? Atomic interactions. This is actually models of the atomic interactions, okay? So uh, we all know that quantum mechanics uh, uh, is, is the basic rules for how mo uh, molecules behave, but uh, there's no solution for the Schrodinger equation, at least for, for relevant systems. So um, what, what we can do is do some kind of approximate models that we, of, of mechanical model, approximate mechanical model, that is quite accurate, but not as accurate as, molecular, uh, as quantum mechanics, but it's quite accurate. So on this, what, what can we model on this, on this, on this, uh, on this? We can model not bonded and non-bonded interactions. What are types of bonded interactions? So for example, the bonds, okay? So there's atoms and atoms are bonded, okay? Together, okay? They have covalent bonds, how we speak. So these bonds vibrate, okay? They have, they have a function that you can see, so they have this they have this equilibrium distance at which atoms like to be, and then there's a function, so an, en an energy function that describes uh, how much the, that bond fluctuates. Basically, there's a spring constant that, that basically classifies this. This is basically a spring, okay, for the bonds. And the same for the angles, okay? There's, there's a bond between, there's three atoms, three, three atoms, uh, sorry, so three atoms are over here, okay? There's, there's also a vibration of the angle, okay? And so on and so forth for the dihedrals as well. For, for, uh, for atoms, they also have this, this uh, functional, which in this case is a periodic function instead of, a, of a, a spring. So where, for example, if you have, <clears throat> there's, there's some preference on the conformation of the dihedral as it rotates around this bond, okay? So sometimes it like so it likes to be in particular conformations and not in the others. So this is what this energy function gives you. So it basically uh, uh, for bonded and then for non-bonded, which basically it's electrostatic. So uh, atoms also have, have charges. Okay, they can be modeled as charge systems, 
or uh, also other types of non-bonded interactions. So all of these sum together, they, 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 they sum up, so the center energy function, they sum up to constitute a force field. But what exactly is a force field? So if you have the coordinates, which you can input on these ones, okay, because from the coordinates you can take the distances and the angles and all of these, then what it's missing, it's these constants that are over here, okay, these numbers that are over here. And these are the ones, basically, that constitute all these parameters that constitute the force field. And uh, there's many ways of you can obtain this force field, but we are not getting too much into that. But this is just to give a general idea. So this, is a, this gives us a physical model that tells us, okay, I have a conformation of, the, of a molecule. Is this, um, how is it? So it, with a given conformation in the, in the force field, I can get a number here, which is its energy, okay? Then, why is this energy useful? So, what we're doing in molecular dynamics, uh, in particular, is that we are uh, basically uh, applying the Newton equations of motion, okay? So, an ND simulation, basically, is a, a, a trajectory over time, okay, that can be generated iteratively by applying a, a given integration algorithm, in this case, the Newton equation of motion. So, Basically, given atoms' initial positions, okay, and uh, we choose a short time, time step, okay, and then remember this U from before, so this energy function, okay, on, on these on this, uh, coordinates, we can do this gradient, okay, this gradient of this energy function gives us the forces, and the forces give us the acceleration, okay, and from this, we can move the atoms to new positions, okay, by applying this by applying the, the, the previous calculations, okay? And then, when we, we move the atoms to new positions, then we can move time forward, and we can repeat this again with the new, with the new positions, okay? So these new positions at time t plus delta t are then inputted here, and so on and so forth, and this is an iterative process that generates new configurations, so new uh, atomic coordinates of your system, okay? This is what we call an MD simulation trajectory, okay? So, uh, an important thing to, think, to take in mind here is the integration step is in order of magnitude of the femtoseconds. So for those of you who don't know what femtoseconds are, they are 10 to the minus, five, uh, minus 15 seconds. So this is a very, very, very small st step. Okay, so if you remember uh, back the, the time scales that we're working on, we're working on nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds time scale, okay? Nanoseconds, it's, it's time, tens times to the six, this number, okay? And then tens times to the nine, ten times to the twelve, okay? So, uh, what, what uh, ten to the twelve, sorry. So, what, what we have here is that we need to do this operation many, many times. And this, it means that it's a very computational, expensive process, okay? So, there, there has been a focus as well in, the, in this community on the optimization of algorithms to do this process. So, this is a very simplified way of seeing it, okay? This is just for you to have a guideline. There are many more steps over here. There are different algorithms. There are different ways of applying this, okay? <clears throat> okay, thanks. So, uh, one thing that we can talk about here is about SMD. So, SMD is a, a software uh, for doing molecular dynamics in GPUs, uh, which uh, was developed by Accelera. Uh, and basically, what do you guys, of course, you guys know what GPUs are. Why, why am I asking this? So, what GPUs allow us uh, is to go to, to have a faster performance, okay? Because this, this, um, this problem of the molecular dynamics simulation is basically it's a problem that is very well solved by, by, by a, a graphics card, okay? Because it's just an, a big array of, of coordinates in space, okay? So it's, it's, uh, GPUs are very, uh, very good for, for doing these propagations. So, SMD is actually the first software to work on GPUs. And, uh, and what SMD allows is to, to reach longer timescales faster and obtain better statistics. But it's also not the timescales that we're interested in as well. Because, for example, if we have a process that occurs at nanoseconds, I just don't, I'm not just going to do two nanoseconds, right? I want, if I want to observe it with relevant statistics, I can, I can, I can, I have to basically sample much more than that, okay? 
Uh, here we have an example of uh, several publications that we have from our, from our groups. So the simulation length, this is logarithmic scale, okay, uh, a long time. And we can see here that basically we have been, in, we have been increasing, okay, in the sense that this, this is not only to developments on the code, but also the uh, increase of, of computational power, okay, so basically Moore's law. Uh, and as well as availability of resources is much easier, okay? So things are getting cheaper as well. You can see it from, for example, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, for example, for doing like uh, making platform, platforms available as a service. So you can see here that we're, we're on this, so this is millisecond time scale, but basically we can predict that we can go to the second time scale, okay? Uh, maybe in, in a few years, maybe in five years we'll be there, I don't know. Let's see. So, now I'm just going to talk about another, another concept, which is high throughput molecular dynamics. So, you saw it on the title, and now you're thinking, so why, what's this about high throughput molecular dynamics? So, this is just an idea that, that basically uh, is kind of relatively recent, because in the past, uh, what, what people working in the molecular dynamics will, will do, would normally they would do a very long trajectory or a very long few trajectories where they were trying to achieve longer timescales, okay? So we're trying to observe a given event, okay? Even if, in, because normally what you're interested in, for example, the binding is a rare event. So a rare event in the sense of the timescale that you're, that you're working on. It doesn't occur very often. So, uh, they were trying to, to sample it, so to speak. So there, there, there has been the advent of new methodology, which, which is basically what I'm going to talk about next, which is Markov state models, which allows to extract long time scales inf information from a lot of shorter trajectories. So I have here just a plot just to show it. So for example, here is just a prediction of some delta, so of some free energy of binding. Let's not focus too much, just, just focus a little bit on the colors. So this is trajectory length, okay, 100 nanoseconds. And this is number of trajectories. What, what we are seeing here, is, so these lines over here is equal amount of generated data, okay? ISO, ISO lines of d data, okay? So this, this is the same amount of data, this is the same amount of data generated, okay? So what we can see is that few trajectories of, of few long trajectories give, give us low, low results, okay? So, very curious results. But you, if you also use uh, a lot, like 500 trajectories of shorter time scale, which are much easier to obtain, because one thing is also scalability. So, MD algorithms, they can, the scalability, they cannot go, for example, without any um, loss of uh, performance to 100 CPUs, for example, or 100 GPUs. There are lots of loss of performance because there's lots of communication. Uh, um, um, there's lots of loss of performance in the communication of, uh, of, of the data that is, gets computed. So basically, we can see here that we can do, uh, uh, this, get the same, um, the same type of results at shorter, trajectory times, but they have longer, um, um, higher number of trajectories, okay? So basically what we do is that instead of doing three simulations of, uh, I don't know, one microsecond, we are instead doing 1,000 simulations of three nanoseconds, for example, okay? And this is only possible because uh, there, there's been this, I can, I can control it, I can control it. Um, there's, be, there's been this uh, thing called Markov state models, which I'm going to explain very briefly. This is uh, uh, um, something that is, um, well, it's just, a, um, it's, it's just basically a methodology. So I'm getting into some details in order for us to understand the rest of the, the session, but not too many. So basically imagine that we have these, our simulation. So different, many, many trajectories of a given length, okay? So what, what uh, uh, Markov state models do, basically we project this data on a, a lower dimensional uh, reference, okay? For example, in a two-dimensional, uh, here we have a two-dimensional frame, for example, where, for example, each one of these dots represent a different conformation, okay? And then after this projection, we can do some clustering 
And then after we have some clustering, we can do some, some estimations, okay? Some estimations of, of uh, transitions, okay? Uh, kinetic estimations, that also allows us to have estimations of uh, thermodynamics. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, go through, I'll go through these different processes, okay? During these times, just, just to give an overview. So dimensionality reduction, so pro the projections that I was talking about. So um, molecular dynamics uh, simulations are very highly dimensional data, okay? Because this is like um, tens of thousands of atoms. Each one has three, three uh, so it's a X, Y, Z coordinate. They also have velocities, which you can exclude sometimes or many times. But still, it's high dimensional data, okay? So normally what you can do is project this data into lower dimensions, okay? So you can use uh, different frameworks depending on what your type of problem is. Uh, you can use dihedral angles, contact maps, distant maps, secondary structures. So there are different ways of doing, of doing this, okay? This is, some of them are very known, like for example, uh, distance maps, okay? They create this, basically this is uh, mm. the distance of the atom against all the other atoms in the system, okay? It can be just, for example, for the protein. This is, uh, for example, interesting for uh, protein folding. But for the case that we are interested in here, which is protein ligand binding, we can have a simulation. So n, n times six dimensions, uh, because it tells also the velocities, the coordinates. Then we can do something like, OK, let's just reduce this dimensionality by just selecting uh, for example, the carbon alphas of the, uh, um, the alpha carbons of the protein against all distances of alpha carbons of the protein against the, the heavy atoms of the of the ligand. Okay, and this allows you to reduce heavily your um, your uh, uh, dimensionality. Okay, the dimensionality of your problem, which of course helps with the rest of of what we're doing. Then I'm just going to talk this very briefly. So. After we also do the dimensionality reduction, well, actually we do first clustering, then we do this, but okay, it's, it's inverted here. But basically we also do this other type of uh, dimensionality reduction, which is called TICA, which basically, if you know PCA, which normally goes along the, the highest variation, TICA is something similar to PCA, but gives you basically the projects on the slowest reaction coordinates, okay? So basically it's what we're interested in. We are interested in, in kinetics of, of the process that, you're, or, uh, that we are interested in, in this case binding. And it also helps us a little bit to, to, to classify better the, um, the transition state, so the barriers, the, the highest barriers, and that clusters on them, okay? So, so I'm going back to, to the clustering. So after, after you have this, this low dimensional space, you can, you can basically cluster it, which is, this is a very rough, I, I think this is easily understandable. So basically, we're trying to transform uh, um, conformations into states, okay? So we're trying to merge them together, okay? So in, uh, in, the, in the end of clustering, what we have, we have a stainless sign or discrete trajectory. So instead of having a bunch of numbers that classify our, our, our uh, conformations, our trajectories, so this is the projected metric, okay, 1, 1, for example, here, okay. Um, then then we, we have the classification of the, as a state, okay. And, and how do you have this classification of a state? Because this is the projection. But then molecular dynamics, we know that this conformation, after it was here, it was uh, at a given place. Because that's what the, the trajectory actually is, okay. It's a time it's a time, uh, a time succession, right? So we know its path. So we know the path of this. So we can transform this pathway. Uh, so we can from, transform this into a state uh, transition, OK? So instead of having numbers, we have rather states. Yeah. And then from these states, we can do something that we call the, the count matrix. So this is what helps us to, to then uh, reach the Markov state model. So basically, if you are in the state, you can just do what, what is the next step, uh, next state where I am, and so on and so forth. And you can do, if I was in before on state A, I, trans I, tr uh, I transitioned to state A 10,000 times. So basically, I stayed on the same state. Or I transitioned 50 times to state B, and so on and so forth, OK? So we, we create this count matrix, which basically tells us how many times there was these transitions. 
And then, uh, okay, and this, this can be done as well in a different way. So we can, we can choose something which is called the lag time, which is how, how fine is the observation time that we want, okay? So you can get on every uh, integration step, or we can have every 10 integration steps, and so on and so forth. And this gives us different Markov models, okay? Because in this case, we are doing a count from A to A, A to B, B to B, B to A, but this, at two frames, we are doing a two jump. So A to B, so this is skipped, okay? So there are, what this means is that slower, uh, slower time scales are getting washed off when we go to a higher lag times, okay? Can you, okay. So then, and we'll see uh, examples further, is that on different lag times, you can calculate the time scales of the process that you're interested in, and then this is allows you to classify your Markov model, okay? But to, we'll, we'll then see this more better in the demonstration. Um, then, from the count matrix, we, have the trans we can calculate the transition matrix, which basically is just row normalization, okay? Uh, or we can do more clever algorithms like maximum likelihood with reversibility. So there are many wo efficient ways of trying to do this. So basically we're transforming this count matrix into a probability matrix. And this is enough. This is already our Markov model. So with, with, with this, we can already uh, forget about our simulations, so to speak, and only... So for example, we had this... 1,000 simulations. We do this Markov model, and then our system of study is the Markov model, okay? We can, we can probe it for, for properties. We can probe it to see what, what it can tell us about our system. And then we can also go back to the simulations as well, because the Markov model tells us which there's a correspondence between the, the, the simulations and the Markov model. So uh, let me see how I'm in time. Okay, it's not bad. Um, so, here I'm going to talk a little bit about... So, we have this very clever technique, right? Markov state models, which after we do some simulations, we can do some analysis on it and know uh, how our system is, if it's binding, if it's not, for example, in the case of protein binding. So, but what we're doing, right, basically, it's, it's this. So, we start a bunch... So, normally, when... Let's, let's think about this. So the direction coordinate here, let's think about, it's a one-dimensional direction coordinate where here you have the ligand on, your, on the water, okay, so on the solvent. Here we have the intermediate state of the ligand before it binds, and then you have the bound, of, the ligand bound, okay? And this is the free energy, so basically uh, high, high free energy, and when it, uh, it's bound, it's low free energy, okay? So we start a bunch of, of simulations from the, the, the ligand on the, on the solvent, okay? And then after we run these simulations, basically they, they end up in different, uh, uh, in different, so some, some shifted to the intermediate state, some are still here on the exploring the, the solvent, others are doing this transition to intermediate state, okay? And then what we do, what we could do next, so this is the explored space, okay? So we, we haven't explored the bound pose, so to speak, okay? So, we can do a second batch, so more simulations where you start exactly from the same and then we do it again. And then, for example, this second batch, we, for chance, because this is stochastic uh, process, we did not sample uh, intermediate or bound state. So this, this, this is new, newly explored space. So this is very inefficient in a way that, for example, if you start 1,000 simulations from here, you can by chance end up here or not. So what we can do is something a little bit more clever, which is accelerating this through something which you call adaptive sampling, okay? So we start the same simulations, okay? The same amount of simulations from the bulk state, okay? And then we do simulations. So this was the explored space, remember? So now what we do is that using Markov state models, we can already with the data that we have available, so we already project this and do all these calculations, you can already see what there are ways of an analyzing and seeing that this is something rare or something that you were interested in, okay? So what we can do then is to start more simulations from this side, okay? Instead of, of because this is already explored space, I already know where, 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 where this is, I want to know more, okay? So these low, low populated states, we can, we can start simulations from here and then what we, this allows us is that it it allows us to get to the bound state much faster, okay? So the newly explored space, 
based on previous knowledge, so if you can stop the simulations and look at it, analyze it and then move forward, it allows us to be intelligent in a way and explore this, the conformational space in a, in this case, the binding space in a, in a, in a more clever way. So we go from, um, so there's no knowledge of so all these simulations that are run in parallel, okay? There's no knowledge. Uh, here is total knowledge, and what we're doing is something around here, okay, which is adaptive, okay, which is, we have, we're adding a little bit of knowledge, and we're, how we are doing this is um, basically doing this adaptive sampling. So we have our initial simulations, then what we do is at a given point, we calculate interesting poses by doing Markov state models, and then what we do is start new simulations, but these new simulations already have knowledge already have gained knowledge here and so on and so forth. This allows us to be, to get to results much faster. So to get to, uh, to the events that we're interested in, which are normally slow, much faster. So here we can actually have an example. The, the thing is that this projector, I don't know if, if, yeah, you can put it, yeah, you can put it in, uh, yeah, the thing is that the other video was, was actually fine. Okay. Good. It's so basically, this is a normal. This is normal MD, conventional MD. This is adapt, adaptive MD. Okay, where basically you're se we have several simulations exploring the space, and then it stops. When it's white, it stops. It's doing this kind of analysis and choosing new points to start, and then it's 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 basically exploring. So this is, but this is not even a molecular. So it's a Muller potential, which is a known potential for doing some, so it's like a, a, toy, a toy example. And if you see here on the conventional MD, it's still here because MD, it's actually good at uh, following um, the energetics, okay? And it actually likes to be here because it's comfortable here. It doesn't like to go explore over there because there's a big barrier over here. So you need to have lots of time in order to be able to explore these other spaces. So if you can see here, you can already see a big difference where M the same amount of data of MD is still here and we're already with adaptive, we're already exploring new, new space, okay? So in the end, you can see the white one from time to time where it stops, you can see the full one. So this is cumulative as well. So if, if, if you see this information that I show you, you not only calculate the simulations that you just performed, you calculate the cumulative of all the simulations that you've done in the past, okay? This allows you to have a complete picture of what you're having, okay? So, yeah, I think you can move forward. So, yeah, here is an example of, actually, it's a practical example that then we are going to demonstrate. So this was published. Um, so this is benzamidine trypsin. So trypsin is this uh, protein and benzamidine is this molecule over here. So basically we call this, all these this, uh, uh, simulations, stopping doing analysis and other simulation, an epoch, okay? So each batch of simulations in an epoch, okay? So we do the first epoch and you see here the, the, the outcome, okay? Can you, yeah, it, I think it's better to put, uh, yeah, I didn't know it was. So, you can see here that, um, so this is the starting point, this is the exploring, okay, and then uh, uh, you, can, you can see here what is the highest populated state, which is this one, okay, and this is what it explored. So. As you, as you move forward in epochs, epoch 1, epoch 2, epoch 3, epoch 4, you can see that, first of all, the delta G, which for this protein is around this number, around minus 6, I think. Uh, uh, so as, as epochs progress, it, you get further and further closer to the, to, the, to the experimental free energy of binding. And also, you get very fast to the, to the binding poses, okay? Here we explore more and then, but you're here already on the binding pose, okay? Then it's just some adjustment and some, uh, but basically, so this is just a general picture of, of the same thing that we were seeing before, but applied to, to a molecular system. So applied to a um, ligand binding, okay? So, um, yeah, so, but this is a, 
a case example. So like trypsin benzamidine, it's like a, a also uh, a toy model for, for testing these this kind of approaches. So actually we, can sh we published recently uh, in collaboration with Pfizer, uh, actually a practical application of, of our methodologies by finding a crypt, so by, for, for cryptic pocket detection in a dopamine D3 receptor, which is a GPCR. Again, the same name for if you guys work uh, uh, on drug discover, um, you'll know this name for sure. This is uh, probably the most targeted uh, molecule. Six, around 60% of the drugs that are in the market target some type of GPCR. So, um, yeah, so this is pretty important in general for pharma companies. So we published this recently um, and uh, basically you can, yeah, basically we apply the same kind of methodology then, then we'll see on the demonstration, but this, this basically allows us so they, they, try to they try to apply docking here, okay? The more, more traditional approach. And docking was good for some ligands, but for some others we was not able to do anything with them. But with our approach, it was able to, to actually find the binding pose of, of this particular ligand. And, uh, and uh, also, there were particular conformational changes that were solved during the dynamics that, that basically we found a new pocket, okay? Uh, this cryptic pocket that needed some, 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 some conformational rearrangement in order to appear for this molecule to bind, okay? So, um, yeah, so, yeah, uh, we can go now, uh, what was the time? So yes. any questions um, from, from this part? No, no questions at all. Maybe the demonstration will start more questions. Okay, uh, you can you can put on this video as well. So actually, this is a video of of the thing that I was showing before. So again, benzamidine dripsin. Okay, this is what you are doing. We are going to do on the demonstration. Adri is going to show us. So there was a native binding cavity. So this is several trajectories, okay? And this is the protein. So the protein is moving, okay? This is, uh, it's, it's in kind of a ball. Uh, so it's in represent, ball representation, okay? Sphere representation. You can see here this binding trajectory, which is in red, which basically we, we, can, we can recover uh, the uh, uh, binding trajectories from, from our approaches. And uh, Basically, um, it also explores here around. It allows you to classify all these, these intermediate states that are over here, for example. As well, you can see that they spend a lot of time in here. They are important for the binding recognition. So, yeah. Uh, so I think we can, we can move on to, to yeah. that, no? Yeah, just um, let me some seconds to prepare this. Yeah, sure. You want me to take this out? To prepare? Mm? You want me to take this? Oh uh, wait, yeah. So uh, this will be only a demonstration session. The thing here is that it, the software is usable for for you guys, okay? And we can actually do a little bit of uh, showing of that as well. Um, the thing is that uh, when I talked with uh, with them, so I don't know what kind of uh, laptops do you have, what's your operating system, so I know that you will be having access to Mare Nostrum, but um, the thing is that most of the things that we are be doing here uh, uh, require a little bit of technical, uh, will be a little bit more technical. So we, we had some problems in the sense that we could export this Jupyter notebook, uh, for example, but then we did not have we could not make work the, the, the molecular visualization and we had to use, for example, VMD, which is a molecular visualization software, which could not, then it would need to be exported through X uh, and uh, through SSH and it was a problem. So we opted for, for doing the demonstration instead of the... Um, instead second. of the... of a practical session. But these tutorials are available for you. And if you have a Linux machine, you can install the software quite easily, which I can also show you. Uh, can I do that, Adria, as well? Oh, you want to show how? Yeah, yeah. like, like uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, uh, software.seller.com. Yeah, you can also go there. It's fine. Uh, yeah. 
it's, a, it's an outdated website as well, but it's easier for us to go there. Yeah. Um, is this still working? I don't. Yeah, it's. Ah, it's there. there. I mean, Many, okay. yeah. Like uh, yeah, the documentation. The yeah, uh, okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Here it's. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can go there. It's okay. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so you can visit this. Uh, so if you go to asalar.com, you, you can easily find this, but you can also go to software.asalar.com, <coughs> where all the software from Asalar is at. And you can easily uh, go through the installation process. It's not that hard. We deploy, we provide our, our software, so HTMD, uh, through, um, so which allows us to do this. Uh, through uh, Conda, which is quite easily uh, quite easy to install, and uh, and uh, then you can also see the documentation. Adria, you can put mm -hmm. can you put there the documentation as well? So all, all these things that we are going to use. So we're going uh, HTMD is is written in Python, okay? So basically, you can have the documentation, the user guide, documentation of the API of how to to deal with it. So how to work with it. Uh, so there's lots of information here which you can extract. Uh, also papers and stuff. If you're interested in this, uh, you can also contact us. Uh, we also are also on GitHub. Can you also go there on this one over here? Uh -huh. So you can also interact us through there. You can see, so the HTMD is an open source software. So you have access to the code. You can see what's going on. Uh, so yeah, so you can see here uh, the project, um, and yeah, you can go on issues, whatever. I mean, it's GitHub; you can do whatever you want. Um, okay. So okay. Yeah. Just some Just some 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 introduction to this part. I guess that. Yeah, if it can be here, like to just uh, is it not? Yeah, I guess that it's better for you to. Um, yeah, just in case. Okay, so now I'm just going, going to th uh, through the, the whole process of preparing a simulation, actually running the simulation and then analyzing the data you've got from it. And we'll see that the HTMD really makes it easy, like much more easy than what it used to be because um, normally with, with, uh, when you're setting up a simulation, you have to do several steps that uh, previously they were not united in, in a single package. So like you, you have to prepare the, the molecule you're going to simulate, like, uh, build it using the force fields, which used to be kind of annoying. And, but now thanks to HTMD, it's made it easy. And it also, also has the several tools to analyze the data and to make it visually and understandable uh, for, for, well, for you to understand it. So it's basically divided in three steps. First, we're going to make the building, which is uh, actually preparing the structure for simulation. Then we're, uh, actually, we're, we'll be setting up the simulations. Well, I'm just going to show you because simulations take a long time. We're not simulating anything. And then we'll, we'll, we'll use some pre already prepared data to uh, show you how to make uh, the analysis uh, workflow that we've showed with, uh, to generate a markup state model and what information can we get from, from it. Okay, so first of all, uh, we're going to start with the building. I was thinking that maybe yeah. were, since this is basically the one that's here, right? So we could tell them where it is. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just prepared the, uh, the things I'm going to show you here, it's just, uh, no, but actually let's, let's go in here because I want to run it and no, show no, you the No, of course, but I'm just saying that they can follow it here, right? Uh, yeah. It's similar, no? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really similar. We can tell them where the notebooks are. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, first of all, we're going to, the, the whole system we're going to prepare and analyze, it's, it's this example we've shown, trypsin benzamidine, okay? Trypsin is this small protein. And, and we're, we, we're going to simulate the, the binding of benzamidine into a cavity on trypsin, and then uh, analyze these simulations to get the binding rates, the kinetics, how, how fast it goes, and several useful information. So first of all, uh, we're going to load, uh, I don't know, 
if you don't work with proteins, I don't know if you work with proteins usually, I don't know if you know the PDB format, more or less. I mean, it's a very old format. It sometimes can be complicated to work with uh, because uh, it, it hasn't been like standardized. It has, it's, it's really old. But um, <coughs> so, well, basically what we do is we load this PDB file which contains the, the, the coordinates of the structure. Uh, we're going to load the, the protein trips in into, into this object, this molecule object that is going to help us uh, to, to, to interact with it and, and get information on it and prepare the simulation. We can either use a PDB file we have locally or use this PDB code here to download it directly from, from the PDB database. Oh, wait, yeah. So yeah, first you need to import HTMB. Of course. Yeah, I mean, my laptop is a little bit limited. Um, okay. So it's already loaded, and here we'll be able to see what we have. This uh, opens BMD, which is an external software for visualizing molecules, okay? So basically, this is Tripsin. I'm going to make it nicer to view. OK, so th this is Tripsin. We can, we can see it here. And then on, on this PDB file, we also have uh, benzamidine. Um, that is uh, actually on the, on the bound state. This PDB comes from the crystal structure, okay? And this crystal structure is um, trips in together with benzamidine bound into the protein. Yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's really easy. So you just, uh, I mean, you can have your, your local PDB file on, I mean, this is just the path, okay? That idea, it's, it's here, okay? It's just the path. Or you can either also, do you know how, how PDB, I PDB works, uh, this database? I mean, every protein, every crystal structure has this four letter code uh, for digit code, so you can put uh, this code also here and it will download the file and load it into the molecule object. And then in this mole molecule object, we can interact with the molecule and at any time you can just... Uh, Sorry, I yeah. just wanted to show that... I mean, sure. So basically you're here. So this is a code for, the, for this protein in the database. So the database that I was talking, the theoretical part, database that has the proteins deposited. Yeah. In this case, this is benzamidine trips. <coughs> if it opens, it would show. Uh, yeah, internet is being a little bit slow. Yeah, uh, but. Um, so yeah, d so let me just. Uh, show, yeah. So basically, you load it on. You, know, you have this molecule object, and then at any time, any modifications you you start doing, you can visualize them like uh, by using protein that view, and. You, you, you need to have BMD or also uh, there's uh, NGL viewer, but because it didn't work on my laptop, I'm using BMD. But the, it, this NGL viewer allows you to visualize it directly in the notebook. It might be more useful depending on, the, on what you're doing. So yeah, basically it's just running this and you can visualize it at any time. Let's see if this, it's yeah, it's not working. So continue, yeah, let's just continue. Basically, this, this uh, view commands that uh, Adri was talking about, basically it's, it's a method of the class, okay? Uh, the so we have the molecule class that basically we can read this PDB into a, a molecule object, okay? And then it has a view method that allows us to uh, 
show it either on DND or on a, a WebGL interface, okay? Yeah, it's uh, basically. Yeah. That, that we do not, for example, we do not develop DND, okay? It's some, if it's a logician software already developed by uh, University yeah. of Illinois or something like that, okay? So. Basically, PDB just provides the coordinates that are just projected here. And yeah, well, there's the protein and there's this, this benzamidine molecule that it's bound into it. We can also, this is an, another useful representation of the protein. Uh, here it's, it, it, it represents like the, the actual surface of the protein. Like, uh, that was just a, like a representation that it's uh, like comfortable to look at, but this is more real on what actu the actual protein would look like. This, uh, this surface represents the forces of, of the atoms that form the protein. And we can see that there's this, this cavity here, like this hole where our, our ligand is it's going into. And we're, we're going to try to simulate the actual process of the molecule getting inside that hole, okay? All right, let's close this for now. <coughs> So, uh, actually, because we want to simulate the binding, we need to remove the ligand that it's already on the hole. So we just, I mean, we're, by, by using this selection, there's this uh, selection commands that allows you to select different elements in this uh, molecule object. You can select either the, 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 the benzamidine molecule, you can select like different amino acids, different regions of the protein. It's, it's really flexible. So, we just remove the, the, the benzamidine molecule. And then the next step, it's, uh, the next step on preparing the protein, it's uh, actually, uh, maybe you haven't noticed, but the PDB structure comes out without hydrogens on the chemical structure of the protein. That's because uh, PDB comes from a crystal structure, and usually on crystal structures, you cannot read the position of uh, hydrogen because of the crystallization process and how it is then translated into a structure. There are variants, well, it's not, uh, the signal is not very strong, so you cannot know the actual position of hydrogen, hydrogen atoms on, on the structure. So PDB comes out without hydrogen, hydrogen atoms. So we need, in order to correctly simulate our protein, we need to put the hydrogens back in the structure. And that is tricky because uh, it, it depends on, it can depend, it basically depends on the pH. I don't know if um, many of you remember what pH is. Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what it is. Basically, pH is the concentration of hydrogens in the environment. Okay, like hydrogen. Uh, it's basically. Uh, let's see if this works. pH. It's also the same as the minus logarithm. of the hydrogen con concentration on the environment. Okay, usually on our bodies it's uh, at 7.4, uh, right? And it's not, it's very stable because it, if it moves some, some on that number, it, it really gets complicated in our bodies, okay? And also protein function and, and their dynamics depends on that because it, uh, it modifies the chemical structure of the amino acids. Okay, so it's important to put correctly those hydrogens on the protein uh, in order to perform uh, a good simulation, okay? For example, there are some, there's, for example, this, this amino acid, which is histidine. It's one of the amino acids that can form a protein. And this one is really tricky because at pH 7, it can have different, uh, three different structures depending on it, its local environment. Well, the structures like, uh, yeah, uh, protonation states, they're called. Uh, so depending on the, on the local environment of this amino acid, uh, the, pro the, pro the, the hydrogens can, can, can form either this, this, this uh, protomer, uh, this one which is positively charged, or this one. And uh, <coughs> it, this, is, this works more like with the chemical intuition and, and knowing uh, how it should and should not. But uh, on HTMD we have this, um, this function which is called protein prepare which uses this, this software, which is PDB to PQR, to compute, uh, uh, to compute these PKA values. I don't want to mess up a lot in these PKA values. It's, uh, 
I don't know if you know it or not, but basically it, it, it's a competition on, on, on from how on the propensity of being protonated uh, for uh, a specific uh, amino acid, okay? Let's just explain it like that. And it computes these, these PKA values for every amino acid and based on their propensity to being protonated or not, um, the function uh, puts automatically the hydrogens on, on the amino acids, okay? You can also set up the pH that you want because that's going to define a lot on their protonation states. So yeah, after all this explanation, you just have to run this command and uh, it will protonate all your protein. It, it gives you different warnings on, on the amino acids that it's, it made the decision, but it mi you might have to look at it because it can depend on, on what you want. Uh, basically, yeah, usually histidines and, uh, appear here because they are tricky. And now I'm going to show you how it looks like. So I don't know if you remember the previous structure, but now this one has these white dots around, okay, which are basically the hydrogens. It has put the hydrogens where it belongs, and now our protein is protonated again and more similar to what the real protein looks like. All right. <coughs> Okay, so now this is, this is just uh, for a next step uh, that it needs to, we need to actually uh, divide the protein into segments so uh, um, the build function knows uh, what, it, what everything is. Um, it's just a technical question I don't want to bother you about. Just we, 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 it automatically puts segments into proteins and we also define water and, and carbon alphas. Then we center it to the origin coordinates. And now we're going to load the, the ligand, okay, which is, was benzamidine that we took out. So here is benzamidine. The, we, we, are, we already provide the structure that has the hydrogens, but uh, sometimes it, it, the, the, these structures don't have hydrogens and Currently now in HTMD you cannot protonate ligands because they have different kind of atoms. But uh, I think you're working on, on something to protonate ligands, so it will be available recently, I, in some time. So now we have the ligand, okay. And, but the thing is that the coordinates but of the, the ligand is... The thing uh, about the ligand is that you don't, in general, you don't care much about its structure. You can take it from a chemical chemistry mm -hmm. database, okay where it already comes with proteins and stuff like that. So uh, you care more about this protonation state. That's another issue, which is also related with this pH. Mm -hmm. but that's another issue. OK, so basically what uh, we want to simulate is the ligand binding into the protein. So w we want this ligand to be um, quite at the distance of the protein to actually simulate the movement. If, uh, now now the, the ligand is, is on, is fits on, on the origin coordinate, it will be in the middle of the structure and that doesn't make sense at all. So we're going to randomize the, the, the rotation of the, of the ligand and also we're going to separate it from the protein so we are then able to simulate it, how it goes in. And for that we just uh, compute the, the, like the radius, the maximum radius on, on, on the protein volume which is the maximum distance from the origin. And then we move it by 10 Armstrongs more to that distance, so it, it, we make sure that it, it is out. And we again, we perform a rotation. And now if we mix it all together, we can see that uh, we have the protein and then we have the, the ligand outside, so it's ready to, uh, for the simulation on the actual binding. All right, so <clears throat> now the next step is to, is to put the protein into water like it would be in normal conditions. So we have to create this water box that it's going to be simulated in. All right, so we define 
this, this D is the previous distance that we defined on the ligand. So more or less, we just defined a cube based on, on that distance uh, with five Armstrongs more. And we, we use this function solvate that uh, will create this water box automatically. So now, as you can see, we have this water box uh, around our molecule. And I don't know if you can see it here. Here it's the ligand. And it's all um, surrounded by water molecules. OK, and now that we have the structure ready, we just need to uh, actually compute the energies and parameterize this structure. So the, the simulation software knows the energies and can compute the forces and move the, those atoms. And to compute these energies, uh, we use the, we use the, what we call force fields, which are already computed. Uh, if I'm wrong in anything of this, because I know, I don't know exactly, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure about this, so if no, I see anything just wrong. this is what I talked about before. So the parameters, okay? The parameters are those spring constants, all these, these things that are necessary in order to complete the function, okay? These were normally determined, how, how, how are these parameters determined? You normally you have test molecules that you do against experimental results that are known or against quantum, quantum chemical uh, data that you can calculate and you can do some kind of uh, approach for fitting these. So there are, there are this field has been going on for a long time in developing these force fields that have been bad in the past, that have been better going. They are always improving. So these are the ones that are available. I mean, there are lots of them available. You need to read the literature <coughs> in order to know which ones are you should be using. OK, so basically, um, these, are, these force fields are used to, to parameterize proteins. But uh, our, our ligand is not a protein, so you actually need uh, parameters for your ligands. That is another part, uh, so you have to obtain that. And uh, here we provide the, uh, we, we provide the default uh, well, topology files and parameters for, for proteins. That is this charm. It's called uh, this charm force field. And then we also add the parameters for uh, our ligand. And we just use this command, charm.build, OK, with the, the, the molecule we have on, on the water box. And it will compute all these parameters. We will also compute the charges uh, of the amino acids and define a charge of the whole environment. And we'll try to neutralize it with some ions. It will ionize all the, all the system, all right? It also uh, automatically de detects the sulfide bonds, the sulfide bonds, which is necessary for simulations because MD simulations cannot uh, simulate the breaking or, or the, the creation of, of chemical bonds. So you need to define them a priori uh, to make sure that uh, they are present because they're important for protein structure. And at the end of the building process, we end up with um, If it opens, we end up with this. It seems really similar, but um, as I'll show you now. OK, this is just protein. And um, as you can see, th this, these balls that appear around are the, these new ions. Uh, to neutralize the charge of the protein, OK? Uh, just to show you that, that uh, it now has more information, this structure. It's not just uh, an object containing coordinates, but it actually has parameters of energies on atoms and charges. So after we have our structure ready, it's now time to prepare the simulations. Mm -hmm. OK. I mean, here I don't actually need to run anything because we're not running any simulation. I'm just going to show you. OK, so first to start with uh, the actual simulation of, of, of our system, 
we need to make an equilibration. Uh, it's basically to just uh, set up and accommodate, accommodate the system uh, to avoid any errors or on the simulation. It's, uh, because the, the, the crystal structure, it comes from a crystal, so it was in solid state, but here we are simulating it on a, on a water, water environment. And let's say that the structure, it's not, uh, uh, I mean, it's, um, how to call it? it? It's not accommodated to, it's uh, like, I'm going to make a silly example now. Uh, so when you're, when you're going inside the pool, for example, that you need like several seconds to accommodate on the temperature and, or on the dif this different environment, we basically need to, to make this the same for the protein. Uh, because if not, we can have problems on the actual simulation. It could explode and not work. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is just a, a protocol uh, that uh, HTMD provides to perform these equilibrations. Okay, we just uh, define some runtime on this equilibration. It's usually short. It's uh, 1,000 femtoseconds, which is nothing compared on, on what we will do later. We just set up, set up a temperature and we perform. Uh, it, this, this just prepares the input files and the actual structure. And then with, uh, with just this command, we can, we can run it either on our local GPU or on, edi, on any other queue, like in our queue system supported by HTMD. I don't know which. Uh, Q yeah, systems you have several, several ones. It can be on, on your local computer, it can be on a cluster of GPUs, uh, whatever. So after we run this equilibration, we just perform this production protocol, which is actually preparing the, the, preparing the, the files that we need to, to make the actual simulation. Okay, it just set up the, the inputs and all the, the things necessary, so you don't have to worry of, of all the different files that you, you have to take care to, to you, you previously had to take care of. Okay, and you can either already start these simulations or um, as we explained, we can, we can perform an adaptive, an adaptive sampling, which needs a little bit more of setup. Um, okay, so if you remember, uh, adaptive sampling, what it was doing is uh, it was performing several epochs of short simulations and in uh, between each epoch, it was analyzing the, 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 the content of, of the simulations we, we already have to select new conformations to start over, so to better explore the conformational space of the protein. Um, so to set up this, uh, we need uh, a specific file structure uh, to perform this, this, this method. Um, okay, so basically, here it's more or less an explanation on the structure. We need some generators that will define the, the, the starting structures, okay, and the input files for the, for the, for the short sim simulations, okay, and after the first epoch, which will start with these generators, it will generate these, these, all these, um, these different folders, which is the data folder on the simulations we, we're performing, the filtered folder, which is just the filter version of the data, taking out the water so it has less file size and it's more tractable and, and, and yeah, easy to compute and analyze. Then we have the generators that we previously have and the input files that it's going to create to uh, set up the, the new simulations in every epoch. Okay? This is automatically done by HTMD. You, you just, it's just to know how the structure works. And yeah, basically uh, here is uh, what um, a normal adaptive uh, sampling script looks like. It's just a couple of lines to define this, uh, <coughs> to, to define what it has to do. You, you can define the minimum number of simulations you want to be running, uh, the maximum number, uh, the number of total epochs that you will have. What is important is to define uh, a, a projection method. So. At every epoch, you're going to analyze your, your simulation. And, and it's important to define a good, metric, uh, a good projection method so it actually looks for what you're trying to explore. So, for example, in our case of, of uh, protein ligand binding, um, it, it would not be useful to just make a projection on, for example, uh, project the coordinates on the secondary structure of our protein because it doesn't make sense. 
what we need to explore it's it's um, what we want to explore it's actually it depends on on the distance uh, from the ligand to the protein so we actually need to define a projection that makes sense on on this exploration uh, so it, it, it is actually useful and it actually enhances the the, the exploration of the conformation of space. So as you can see here, we have defined um, a projection which is uh, the distance between name CA is the carbon alphas of the protein and uh, here it's uh, two, important, two important atoms, heavy atoms from our ligand which is benzamidine. And yeah, basically you just uh, run this thing, you can run it on a Jupyter notebook, you can set up this update period so it will it will uh, run in every, for example, every four, four hours, or you can either just prepare it on a script and just uh, set up like crontav or whatever. So it just runs, and what we'll do is check the simulations that are already running. Uh, if there are any completed, it will retrieve them, uh, store, it in, store them in the data folder, and we'll analyze them. And if you need to, if you need to, to put more simulations because you're under the minimum you set up, it will ana analyze them, select new conformations from where to start, and will uh, respawn them again. So it's all au automated and it's easy to use. And no, we don't have time. Okay, so it just okay. All right. So now. Uh, this is, was just to show how to set up simulations. Uh, they actually take long, so we're, we have uh, already some prepared simulations and we're going to show you the analysis protocol that we perform usually. So yeah, I just run some commands before because there are some of them that take a little bit of time, so not to, to lose time. So uh, um, after we've performed this adaptive sampling method, we, we, what we have is uh, several folders with short simulations on them. Okay, so we need to load them all uh, in, a, in, a simil in, a, in a common object so we can use them. Uh, so what we do is, uh, is, is we load them in this sim list, the simulation list. Um, yeah, we, we, we load the, the filtered trajectories so uh, it, ha it has it's, it has less file size and it's easily to analyze because we, are, we actually don't care about the waters or their positions. Uh, we just care about the protein and, and, the, and, and our ligand. So we, we load all this, the simulation trajectories inside this simulation list. Okay, and then what we do is um, here we, we're going to start the, the analysis workflow which uh, first came, we want, first we want to reduce the dimensionality of, of of the data in our trajectories and then after we've uh, reduced, the, reduced the dimensionality we will cluster this space and create a Markov model based on, on that reduced dimensionality data. Now the simulations uh, are just uh, a coordinate positions of, of, of the atoms and what, uh, what we're going to do is project them into a lower dimensional space which uh, we'll define as, as the distances between atoms on the protein and uh, heavy atoms on the on the ligand, okay. And to perform this, it's just really easy. We we just load our simulations inside this metric object, okay. And this metric object uh, serves us to project the coordinates into different um, into dis different features. We can either be distances, contacts. It can be a secondary structure. Um, it can be also surface accessible area. The, the HTMD provides different tools to, to, to make this projection. And yeah, you just set the projection you want and you actually project the data. It has already been computed, okay? And then after we have uh, our projected data, we, well, this is to set up the, the frame steps. So we have our trajectories are saved into frames, which do not represent the, ac the actual time, okay? To save to just save space, and we define the time that uh, every frame accounts for, which is 0 0.1 nanoseconds. This is usually in nanoseconds. Don't don't worry about that. This function is also uh, useful because uh, sometimes when you set up lots of short simulations, some of them can have like some errors; they can break or whatever. So maybe you don't have uh, all the trajectories don't have the same length. 
So to avoid problems, we just uh, take out these uh, short trajectories, okay? They're, they're, for, for example, in our, in our uh, model data, we, we had uh, 852 52 trajectories, but both two of them weren't long enough, so we just took them out. Then here we perform the, the tick analysis, which just uh, from the projected space of the distances between the ligand and the protein, what it does, it projects all these dimensionalities into three dimensions, only, no, actually just, yeah, three dimensions. This is just the lag time, and, and it projects it into three dimensions, which will be the, the most relevant coordinates around the, the slowest time scales. Okay, then we just, I think this is the last step that, that I did because it takes seven minutes, so I already did it. And then um, we just can bootstrap our data to, so you can perform this several times to actually confirm that, uh, that your analysis is it's solid and it's not depending on, on just some small part. Okay. Then we cluster our data. You can use different cluster algori algorithms. Uh, here we're using k-means, but uh, depending on, on how you cluster your data, the, the Markov model is going to be different. So take that in mind. Okay, so, and after we have clustered our, our data, we're ready to uh, compute the transitions between the, these different states that we've created. We load it into this model object, which is the, the object we use to compute all these, um, well, to compute the Markov state model. And now uh, the, important, the thing we have to do is to define a, a, a lag time uh, from, what do you, from where you define the transitions. And to do that, we are going to perform this, uh, the plot we've previously uh, seen, which is the implied time scales plot, which basically what it does, it's now creating a Markov model for different lag times and uh, plotting the, the, the time scales, the, the, the slowest time, the, well, basically the time scales from that Markov model. And we're going to select a lag time where um, these, these time scales are consistent, consistent even if we select longer time scales. Ah, when the plot gets, gets out, uh, I think it will be more understandable. This takes some time. And yeah, after basically this Markov model, uh, I mean, w all this process is done just so we can actually understand what's happening at the mole molecular level because uh, looking at just trajectories can be confusing and you don't actually, you cannot get binding rates or kinetic rates by just looking at the, at the trajectories. You need to, uh, you need somehow to understand what's happening there and because of this high dimensionality of data, it's, it's almost impossible for us to understand it directly. So all this is just to kind of coarse grain all this data and transform it into some states that we can uh, actually interpret and, and analyze. And also uh, this, this creation of the Markov model allows, allows us to, to, to create a model to understand the transitions between states and actually compute interesting properties like binding, binding rates and kinetic rates. So yeah, just taking a while. My laptop is a little bit slow. So here, as you can see, there's a little bit more uh, extra procedures or that we presented. This is a very complex uh, procedure and uh, for example, this part of the, the time scales, it's not obvious, it's still a bit uh, intuition on how to choose if the model is, the models are good or not. It still requires a little bit of expertise. So it's also hard to understand as well. Yeah, I mean, we need more, just some more experience. In our yeah, we just two it. hours, it's kind of difficult. Okay, so here are the, the time scales. Basically what we are doing is building a Markov model at, at every lag time and plotting the implied time scales, which is the, the, the transitions we're seeing on, on this Markov model. And, and here are the, the, the slowest ones. Okay, so uh, as you can see, with just small lag times, the, the time scales projected are, 
are, are different depending on the lactame, but at a certain point, they, they, start being, uh, they start being stable, they converge into um, some time scales, so we can just select uh, a lag time where these, these are, are stable, okay? For example, a lag time of, of five would be, five nanoseconds would be enough. Let me just say something. Yeah, so maybe for, for people that have a little bit of uh, algebra background, so basically when we choose, for example, lag time, we, have, we do a Markov model for it. And when we do a Markov model, basically we calculate a transition, prob uh, transition probability matrix. So this is just, an uh, it's a matrix, okay? So what normally it's done in order to obtain this is that you can decompose your matrix in, eigen, in its uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And what we are showing here is the eigenvalues. So in these eigenvalues, uh, from the theoretical developments of Markov state models, they are ordered in, the, in their in, in intrinsic time scale, or in this kind of implied time scale, okay? So there's the slowest process of them all, which is actually not shown here, and this is the second time uh, eigenvalue, and so on and so forth. They are all ordered, and they are all corresponding to a given time scale. There's actually an equation that, that transforms a given eigenvalue into a, a, an actual time time scale based on the lag time that you have. So there's a theoretical background behind this, which is actually explained in very recent papers. I think it's, I mean, it hasn't even hit the, the, the general uh, textbooks. I mean, it's probably hitting right now. So this is recent research, so it's hard, it's not something that is trivial, so to speak. But it's basically, this is a general idea. And if you know a little bit of algebra and about decomposition, of matrices, it's a little bit of what's going on here. So this transition probability matrix has the inherent dynamics of the system in, in built in, in into it. So yeah, basically after seeing this plot, uh, we're going to define our Markov model. We define the lag time of five, okay, just by looking at the stability of the time scales, and also we want to to model our our Markov model. Uh, based on just the slowest time scales, because we don't care about the, the fastest time scales, which might be just some rotations or movements on, on some amino acids. We actually care, what we care about is how the ligand went into the protein, and that uh, I can assure you that are, those are the slowest time scales. So we'll care about the slowest ones. So we're just going to model the, 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 f the, four, four, the four slowest time scales, and just this, all these ones are just, we don't care about it. So, we're defining our Markov model with five macrostates, okay, based on the slowest time scales on this plot. All right, so we just define our model. Okay, oh, we have already the plots. So we don't care about this. Um, the model is being computed, and then you can make this, this kind of plot, which is the energy surface of, of, your, of the data you have. This is not very useful, but maybe this one here, which uh, plots it with the, the microstates of your model. So, so you can see where, where the, the states you have on your model actually go into these energetic plot to see which ones correspond to more energetic structures or to more stable structures. I mean, I'm just talking about states and, and you know what it is, but we'll, after this is computed, we're going to actually see them, which I think it's much more useful. So yeah, now, now it's uh, creating visualizations of, of each macro state, selecting yeah. like relevant conformations from each state, and it will load them into BMD and, 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 and put it there so you can actually understand what's, what's going on in this Markov model. It's taking a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. So it's loading the, the models, okay? Just so we can understand a little bit what we've done. Um, let's hide them. Mm. It's three, three. So we see this this uh, this state, which is state three, okay? Which is the 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 unbound state, the bulk state. As we can see, it's the state where the ligand is outside the protein and it's still finding its way into 
the, the pocket that we saw previously. And if, if we look at the plots here, okay, um, the state three, which uh, it's this one here, it's usually on, an, on a high, in a, well, it's a little, it's very stable, but it's not on the most stable part, which would be this one, which uh, relates to the bound state, okay? And then we have several different models, uh, seven different states, which is on different bound states of the ligand on different positions. Okay, this is, so we can see that the ligand here, we have different, there's different states, actually the, the, the bound one is it's, it's number four, which I think it's the brown one, yeah. So as we can see, our model has, has, um, has divided the, all the conformations we had on all, all of our trajectories and clustered them into these macro states, which is actually meaningful uh, and it depends on the kinetics of what we've seen on, on, the, on the simulations. So we had this previous state, which was the ligand unbound, and then we have these different states. We have this state, which is a transition state between the bound and the unbound. It's, it's, it's starting to, to get into the, the bound position. Then we see that there's another state which is already more close into the bound state, and then we have the actual bound state we found with our simulations. Then we have also this state, which is uh, the ligand binding into some other region, but uh, probably if we, if we look at it, at the plot, okay, this is, uh, I don't know which state is this. Yeah, it's a state zero, so we look at this plot, the state zero is actually in a high energetic uh, part of the plot, which is up here. State zero is this blue one. So it's in this region here, and actually state four, which is the bound state, it's on this region here that if you remember, well, this is from the plots here, it's actually the, the least energetic part, so the most stable one. So uh, when we create Mar a Markov model, it's to actually represent all the trajectories we have into this understandable data that allows us to describe uh, what's happening in this binding process and to actually get uh, uh, interesting, yeah, and also. Let me just say something. Yeah. One important thing here is that we did not say anything to the system, okay? We did not say what was bound. These states arose from the pure analysis, okay? We did not put the, say, okay, the ones that are outside are the bulk or on the solvent. No, this came from the poor analysis of the separation of the states, okay? This is just applying consistent uh, analysis. The same analysis on another different system should give us exactly the same kind of information, okay? Without us telling where is the binding site. So, the, for example, the bound state that we are here saying is because we already know, because it's a toy system, okay? This is a system that we already know where the binding site is. But what we are then confirming is that with our system, we're actually seeing that that's the most stable one, okay? So, it's a little bit just to, to let you know that we are not putting any of this known, this knowledge into the analysis that we are performing, okay? All right, and then to just end uh, this session, uh, HTMD provides uh, also functions to, from this data to get the kinetic uh, information of, of these simulations. So we're going to compute the kinetics between these states that we have defined, okay? And you can get these rates here, which actually, these rates here defined define how, the, uh, how, how the, the, pr the thermodynamical and kinetic properties of the binding into the ligand into the protein. So this is what, uh, for example, when you're make, making drug discovery, it's this, this is what you care about. This is what is defining if this ligand is good to, to bind into the protein and, and, to, and to generate an effect that you care of, or if it's not going to work and it's, you can reject that. Uh, in, in your drug discovery process. Basically, you, you care about this, um, this uh, ener energy term uh, to see if it actually binds or not, if it's a strong binder or not. The, the, the KD, which is the equilibrium constant between the rates, uh, well, yeah, that uh, it's more and of the a free biological end. part. 
and yeah, you can plot the, the, the kinetic rates and you can also uh, create this flux pathway between the, the macro states you have defined to see how how your system behaves kinetically. So you just start, you just start here from your unbound, unbound state, from the bulk state, and you can directly tra transition into, into the bound state without intermediates. You can also go into different intermediate states, and then there's the other bound state, which is separated from, from all of this. Uh, and yeah, so basically, this is, this is just the end. Um, basically, we have shown you how to, with HMD, you can set up this, uh, you can prepare your systems, set up your simulations, and perform, we provide with these different tools to perform a full analysis on your simulations, so you can actually extract relevant information from the simulations you have performed. And yeah, that's all. I don't know if you have any questions from this part. Okay, I guess not. And well, yeah, I guess we can call it an end. Uh, thank you for your attention. And that's it. Okay.